the moment, we're, we're trying to integrate art into the buildings, into the streetscape, into the, the fencing around the, we, some of the, uh, on 123rd Street, for example, if you look at the site plan, it has courtyards for the residential units that reach the ground floor, and those courtyards would be contained by low-level walls and or fencing, and in that fencing would be in integrated artwork. We also are showing that same kind of detailing going up the facades of the buildings. We think this is something we can work out with the MOCA institution, that perhaps they could supply artists to do this work and adorn the, 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 the fencing and the ground, freestanding objects on the ground, mm -hmm. as well as on the building facades. Or it could be open to other artists, but we're suggesting it because we think it's very important because it, it greatly enhances the, the streetscape for the neighborhood, for, for vehicles, for pedestrians, and it connects, again, this site to the MOCA institution. Um, the unit types, and another very important statistic which I want to mention is that North Miami apparently has about 175 elderly in this area, and 73% of them are burdened with housing costs that that range from 30 to 50 percent of their income. And of that 875, 475 are burdened with housing costs that exceed 50 percent of their fixed incomes. So it's a serious problem. So th this project hopefully will help many seniors that are in that category because it'll be affordable, it'll be financed as affordable housing, and it'll be very affordable based on their incomes uh, for them to live there. Some of the design points that uh, I'd like to re mention are that it, as I mentioned, is responsive to the downtown community needs the, of the NRO district. As the staff report mentions, it's compatible, it's enhancing, it's fitting, and it's complementary to the surrounding neighborhood uses. Nice word. I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, it provides retail components, 9,200 square feet, of which 1,800 is, is MOCA for education and studios. It has a significant amount of open space. If you add up the areas around those buildings that are on the pedestrian plazas, it's 25,800 square feet. 25,800 square feet of open space that's going to be landscape, hardscape, and art artistic elements. Um, I mentioned about the trees. There's over 65 trees being added, nine of which are the existing. The private housing has its own open space components. The rooftop of the resident of the garage. We, oh, we have a freestanding garage, structured garage, that's four, essentially four stories, and it, it provides 151 spaces. The ground floor spaces are for the uh, retail uses and which is small retail use and or cafe, whatever may come to there, and also for the ALF facility. The upper floors are designated for the residents, and it's all self-parking. No tandem, no lifts at this time, all self-parking. The rooftop of the garage, there's two rooftops, and you can see it on sheet A1.03. Uh, I have actually here. microphone turned on Sorry. Yeah. apartment building wraps the site on the north is 124th Street on the west is a, a multiple family uh, apartment house on the west and then it wraps around to the south and ends on 123rd there's seven levels on 124th by the way the NRO allows 110 feet 11 stories we're only taking it to seven the rest of the building is six stories on, uh, to a maximum height of 55 feet as it reaches 123rd Street. The ALF facility is on the corner of 123rd and 10th Avenue. It also is seven stories. First level is all therapy and, and administrative functions. Five levels of, of housing 
for the elderly, and then the rooftops of the garage, they're two different levels because the garage is split. One half of the garage is, is a half floor below the other half. So on the top level on the north side, we're designating 11,000 square feet of open space, pools, gardens, recreational play, playground, covered areas for fitness and yoga, things like that for the residents, bathrooms, and maybe even a little barbecue facility on the rooftop of the garage connected to the residential tower building. On the rooftop of the south side of the garage is 9,000 square feet, actually 8,900 square feet, and that will be gardens for the elderly, for the ALF facility, therapy gardens where they can literally grow uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that, and then artistic gardens that they can walk and meander and they could have sculptures on that garden, that was our intention. Elevators can take you up to all these levels, both from the residential building, freestanding elevators from in the garage, and other elevators from the ALF. So it's all connected into one system of buildings, open space and landscaping. Wanted to mention uh, pr surrounding the garage, so you don't really see the garage, we're gonna have landscape buffers 14 feet on the north, 11 feet on the west, and 12 feet on the south wrapping around the garage, so, and that will be filled with trees and hanging plants from the structure of the garage so that some of the apartments that would be looking that way would be looking into gardens, vertical gardens, and then rooftop gardens. Same thing for the, some of the apartments or, or rooms of the ALF facility. Uh, that pretty much describes the building. Let me see if I left out anything. If you add up the total open space of the garage structures, which is 19,000 and 28,000 on the ground floor, let me show you that ground floor again. Sorry. It went somewhere. I, okay. These are pedestrian plazas that we mentioned. You can see it's like 30 feet along the south side to the, uh, actually 40 feet to the curve line. It's about 25 feet and there'll be hanging gardens in front. The only garage face that's exposed to the public is on 10th Avenue. And if you look at the, the renderings and the plans, it'll be a series of garden levels hanging down, coming down to the ground. And then the broad pedestrian ways continue all the way around the north side. We have a bus stop, covered bus stop on 124th Street. We have one service space there, which is right here, that will be, provide loading, unloading, and refuse collections, which are very close to that service space. More hardscape and, and landscape wrapping all the way around. And on the south side, the only, we, we also have street parking that were designated parallel parking in the right-of-way that we, we intend to provide. There's 12 of them. There's uh, 246 on 10th Avenue and 6th on 124th Street. No parking on 123rd. That was something the neighbors recommended and requested. We used to have parking there, but we took it away. We only have one service space at the uh, southwest side, which will service this elevator. And we have two lobbies for the residential, one off 124th, one off 123rd, and two refuse collections close to those service spaces. The parking access comes off primarily off 124th, and it loops around, split level garage. We do have one entry off of 10th Avenue, which would be convenience for the retail. And we have a drop-off area, covered drop-off, in the garage for the ALF facility, so they can walk directly undercover into the ALF facility, visitors as well as patients that may, may be living there and residents that may be living there. Uh, that pretty much concludes our, our physical point. I, I would just like to say, as architects and planners, we're delighted with these opportunities. It's, it's really exciting. It's a privilege. We're humbled by the importance of this task. It's really important to make all this work in this site. And we're really proud of the development commitments of our principal developers. It's v 
very bold commitments. And uh, as uh, my father used to tell me, you should cover them up. They shouldn't catch a cold, but they should stay committed to this process. And I know they will. And by the way, we're doing several projects for Blue Road, one of which you mentioned, Mr. Each, on 139th in Biscayne, just east of Biscayne. It's project. in North Miami Beach called the Highlands. That's a nice project. Right, yeah. and we're doing another Beautiful. one just north of that, mm -hmm. which will be 200 units. So they're very, they have a lot of chutzpah, you know, they have a lot of guts to go into these areas that need these kinds of facilities, Beautiful. and they stay with it. And they're here today, nice project. and I'm very proud of them, and I thank you very much, George, for your confidence. That's it. All right, thank you very much. Does that conclude the presentation for, the, for your side, sir? For now, yes. All right, at this time, the uh, chair will open the public hearing. But one thing I would like to add, oh, I yes. do recognize that this is, has to go through. You're, we're here for allocations of density, as John mentioned. After that, it goes to council to, uh, to approve that or not. Then it starts the DRC process. We, we got very involved in the design of it already because we had met with staff for years now. Mm -hmm. So, but we recognize that in the DRC process, things could change, modifications may have to occur, and we'll, we'll roll with that. And then after DRC, it comes back to you for your review, and then again to the council. So we understand it's a process. All right, thank you. At this time, the public hearing is open. People wishing to speak to this, we'll have two microphones if you line up down the center aisle so that we move our public testimony along as quickly as possible. Can we move I, the easels? Yeah. Uh, by the way, Can you um, move the easels? <laughs> since, since we're, we're dealing with that, uh, thank you. Marlene, let the record reflect that the uh, clock in council chambers is an hour behind. It's actually 10 minutes after 11, I think. Not 10 minutes after 10. Noted. Yes, yeah, so uh, we need to get that <laughs> clock set up. Uh, minor thing, but ask maintenance to take care of that this week if they can. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Ilian Alvarran, 849 Northeast 121st Street. According to the North Miami Economic Profile, our city is young. 68% of the population is under 40, and the fastest growing portion of our population is between 20 and 29 years old. How is an age-restricted housing facility going to benefit residents in North Miami? According to the latest study presented by the Urban Land Institute, our biggest asset is the MOCA, and according to our year-based comprehensive plan, we should be prioritizing development public space and programs that create a lively place in the downtown and attract people and visitors, a cluster around our assets, the MOCA and the design shops. This current law is two blocks away from the MOCA. This Proposal has 175 units, tiny units, 500 square feet, plus 70 people living in assisted living facility, plus visitors and staff, and only 151 parking spots. So when we do get a visitor to our downtown to visit our MOCA or one of our restaurants, we're not going to be able to have parking available for them. Currently, we have 110 signatures on an online petition from residents who are opposing this project because they know that in October 13th, 2015, Tap J, when they presented their project to move the inner low line to accommodate for this lot, they had to meet an art component. And they proposed two stories along 123rd Street of art residencies, art lofts, and collaboration with the, the MOCA, which should be a covenant to this project because right now these plastic art flaps that they have along the side do not meet the, the art criteria for the NRO district. Um, the area floods and any construction there is going to flood neighboring structures bringing down our property values. During the hurricane that lot was used for emergency vehicles to facilitate the, the, the cherry pickers. And if we allow this current construction to take place, we're going to have flooding areas, it's traffic problems, and it is just not advisable under our current 
future for North Miami, vibrant development. All right, thank you. I don't you. know if my time's up. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next. Good evening. Valerie Holt, 1050, oh, Northeast 122nd Street. Just directing Street. traffic here. Okay. Right, all right. 47 years in my home. Been through a lot with the city. Um, according to your own NRO, it's, although you have a market-driven outlook, the manor does not mar the character and the peace of the existing neighborhoods located adjacent to these developments. How can you say this doesn't when we can look at our homes and see a six or seven story building? But my real concern is when this gets developed, as Ileana said, where do people park? When I asked the gentleman who spoke prior to us, he said, well, they're seniors, they don't have cars. 55, uh, some people would take exception. I'm past 70, I got a car. <laughs> Okay, and sometimes I even drive it around, and sometimes I have company. Where do they go? 175, and not all of them are for seniors. Some of them are going to be designated for affordable working force. Teacher, I'm assuming they don't teach next door. They need a car. They may be married. They may have a spouse with a car. Okay, then I believe he said 100 employees. 151, and there's 100 permanent employees there? How, what parking is he designated? I know where the parking is going to go in my front lawn, all our swales. It's unrealistic to assume that it's not because people will park wherever they need to park to go and do whatever they need to do. That's, what, that's human nature. That's number one. My second major concern, aside from totally inadequate parking for this, is the fact that while this is being built, the several years it's going to take to build this, again, where does all the heavy equipment go? Where does all of the materials go for this building? Where do all the workmen go? All over our neighborhoods, parking wherever they need to go. You've seen construction around the city, the bulldozers, the forklifts, the cranes, they ride up on the swales. Nobody comes back and fixes it when they're done. It's there. We maintain our property as well as the swales. We're, li we're obligated to do that. And now we're going to be obligated to maintain parking lots for this building. Please reconsider. All I can say is ditto for the last item that was on the agenda. I think we all feel the way the Sellers people felt. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, Erica Peterson, 811 Northeast 123rd Street. Uh, my neighbors and I have grave concerns over this project, uh, not least of which is its location in a residential <coughs> neighborhood directly adjacent to we call them multifamily. These are two-story historic 1940s apartment buildings and 1940s era duplexes. And Caddy Corner to a, a single-family home that just sold for, I think, $340,000, and they've been fixing that up. So it's a little misrepresentative to say it's in a multifamily area. Now, from a zoning perspective, I know the PU zoning designation. I'm not sure what section it is. I didn't have as much time to prepare for this. It does not allow for assisted living facilities. Our code also does not allow ALFs within 2,000 feet of one another, and this project is across the street from Villa Maria, which is roughly 80 feet from the property line. Furthermore, the developer is somehow considering this a community facility, even though it's not open to the community, only private citizens. However, even then, our community facilities are not allowed inside the entire NRO boundary, only in the PCD portion, which according to the latest future land use map, is not. this is not located within, hopefully, um, someone at the city can clarify these issues. Finally, the west boundary where it abuts the two-story apartment building. Uh, I believe it should be a 25-foot setback because I think it's an R2 zoning designation. Hopefully someone can look into that because we're only showing 10 feet here and those poor buildings are going to lose every eastern sunlight that they used to have. Furthermore, I just think this is not the appropriate project for our neighborhood. It's not the appropriate project to welcome people into our downtown. Um, I think we deserve better, and like Commissioner Each said, we don't want to jip our residents, and we want high-end, not mediocre <coughs> projects, and I just don't see that from this project. So thank you. All right, thank you. Next. Oh, hi. My name is Erasema Pires, and I live in A10 Northeast 123rd Street. I've been living there for 14 years. What a um, concerns me it's um, how senior housings 
can increase, number one, the value of our houses since this is going to be houses that is going to be determined by the income of the seniors. And it has um, the architecture express, you know, seniors are going to a lot of burden. So I don't see how building as big with 175 units and at the end going to be 300 people living in there. So it's not enough capacity. Two, transit-oriented des design it. I really can see how a transit-oriented design it is going to be. Me to get out of my house at 8.30 in the morning, uh, cars don't stop and they zoom really fast. And it was said, the third thing that really bothers me was that where they're going to build, it said that it's illegal dumping. I've been living there for 14 years, and I never saw anybody dumping anything in there, not even a, a mattress. So all of a sudden, in here in front of the commission, it became a dumping, illegal dumping. Not true. Not true. So I, I really, I guess, me and everybody else that is in front of you is asking all of you to concern all these projects that are bombarding North Miami. It's not going to be good for the residents. They can be built in a better area, more commercial area, but not where residents are living. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Name and address, please. Yeah, my name is Carl Hoover. I live at 1070 Northeast 122nd Street here in North Miami. Um, I do agree that the lot needs to be developed. Um, it's been an empty lot for a long time. I, I don't agree with the project. I, uh, I do applaud their efforts to bring more affordable housing. Um, I don't understand exactly how. Um, another ALF, I think that Villa Maria, in my opinion, calls it. Why it's an ALF, I think they've been poor neighbors and, in fact, have come to the council before asking for a, a development in the park and was turned down. I don't see how this will be significantly different or I have concerns about it being so significantly different. Um, I'm not sure what guarantees that it will be stay affordable. This is Miami. We have a market economy. Um, who will decide that it remains a senior building forever um, just because the developers at this point say it is. I'm here for the long run, and I have been paying freight, as uh, the commissioner said here, for 17 years. And I don't believe that more rental will make my neighborhood, my house, particularly more valuable. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Name Hello, and address, everybody. please. My name is Marisol Medina. I live at 1270 Northeast 124th Street. Um, I guess overall, we're all kind of scared. These buildings are getting real tall, and we're all still so little, you know. I know we can probably build taller later on, but right now I live on 12th Avenue, and I'm going to see this building very clearly from my house. So that's always a little, you know, uncomfortable. Um, the points that are made all before, you know, we don't all want to repeat, but we're all kind of like on the same page. Um, the rental portion of things does make things kind of scary because I lived in a restricted age facility and I'm 29. So there are certain guidelines that allow younger people to come in. Um, I know part of it's age restricted, but other parts can not be. And It just, what's going to ensure that it's going to stay beautiful and green and the layout that they show us is going to be the same because originally the layout looked awesome. Where that parking lot was going to be, it was going to be all green and, and lush and open to the community to kind of come in and around in collaboration with MOCA and the art design district portion of things. Um, you know, having some artists come in and maybe do the interior approach, it's just cut off. It's so cut off from everybody else, and it makes it not feel as uh, welcoming to the neighborhood. Um, I do want to move forward with recommending this not to go any further. I mean, uh, they got enough units, I guess. They're already going to approve in some way going through with this. I don't think that they need additional um, homes or areas for people to be dwelling inside of seven stories, six story, three story. <laughs> it's all quite a, quite a lot. So I'm going to recommend that we say no moving forward. Thank you guys for your time. All right, thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to this? I do All right. Uh, you, 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 well, you, you'll need to get the hand microphone then. I'm going to stand up here. That's fine. 
Okay, fine. Okay, my name is Mary Schubeiler Hoover, and I live at 1070 Northeast, 0122 Street. And um, in looking at this, I'll be honest, I thought that must be Biscayne Boulevard because that certainly isn't 123rd, um, a block of, or two away from my home. Uh, my area is residential. That rendering is not. Um, and what I am very concerned about is that the residents have a lovely view from inside, a phenomenal courtyard, all this beautiful greenery, but those of us who live in the community that exists around this get to see seven stories of that. Um, that is not a community. That is not a neighborhood. That belongs on a much busier street in a much busier area of our community. It is not welcoming to downtown. It does not fit the vibe. It does not fit the nice little kind of mall feeling that we have along with Cafe Cream and, you know, uh, the, the mocha and the, the little you know, Luna Star and all those wonderful little things. This does not belong there. I see this over by maybe Whole Foods, somewhere over in that neighborhood, but not in the neighborhood where it's planned for right now. I don't think that this is compatible. I don't think that this is fitting, and this certainly is not enhancing to my neighborhood. And I am, again, very concerned about traffic. We have enough with the, the traffic we are, as is, this will funnel in far more cars, far more traffic. We have parking issues. We'll have lots of traffic issues. Go into this neighborhood as it exists now, any morning in rush hour, any afternoon around rush hour, and throughout the day. And this will dramatically increase those problems. Um, you are ruining a neighborhood. Uh, you are not adding value to it. You are diminishing and you are hurting my property value and the value of all of our homes around this. Um, I strongly encourage you to please don't let this go forward or put it somewhere else where it's more fitting. But it is not fitting, it does not enhance, and it does not, is not compatible with the area in which you're planning or discussing to place it at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Alina Medina, and I live at 1270 Northeast, 124th Street. Um, I, I had heard, I was in the presentation originally um, given to the residents and what this place was going to be. And as many of us were very happy to hear what was going to be. And um, I'm very concerned of how uh, the city changes and what is initially, initially presented, a complete change of what it is now. I, I do agree that we need uh, uh, places for the elderly to live. I, I, I agree that, but this is not the place for it. Um, there's also uh, one of my uh, neighbors was also indicating that uh, there was no mention about this 70 beds for the elderly. Is that also counted in what's being allowed? Um, I'm not sure about in the dwelling units per acre, the 70 bed units. Well, sure it's about. not for the commission to answer the question directly, but you raise it and the developer will have the opportunity to respond. Okay. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Yes, sir, state your name and address for the record. John Chisholm, 850 Northeast 123rd Street. And I kind of feel like we're just going through the motions and butting our heads up against the wall because we've already have things shoved down our throats in this our little section of this neighborhood when the traffic from West Dixie was routed down 123rd Street, now it's become like a thoroughfare. Um, this, this monstrosity of a building that is just gonna tower over the, all the single-story buildings, even the two-story buildings that are around it, it's, it, it's gonna put so much traffic and additional into that, uh, into our streets. People are going to, not enough parking, people are going to park uh, on the swales. You've heard it all. And I just kind of feel like we're the little guys that are being ground down because, yeah, we've been paying our taxes. We've owned our properties for decades. We've had our little, we've been, do, you know, keeping them up. But, hey, it, uh, Nobody makes real money off of us. We're just little guys. And I just feel like we're being ground down so that some monstrosity can be forced into where it really shouldn't be. So I don't really think I'm gonna change anybody's mind on the commission, but I just wanted to voice my frustrations. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Step forward, state your name and address. 
My name is again is Dr. Hector Medina. I live in 12 Seminole Norris, 124th Street. Uh, initially, this project was pre presented to us, and it was very beautiful. It was supposed to be for artists, and uh, they will live upstairs, and their studios will be downstairs, and there was going to be a rotunda, and uh, the water issue, which is an issue, because I don't even go to those banks, because there is always water. And uh, I, I, I wash my car every day. I, I don't, just don't go to those banks. Uh, now, again, the methodology and the way these studies were conducted, and I appreciate Commissioner James asking about it, as a scientist, as somebody who uses the scientific method through his whole life, I'm telling you it's wrong. I, I mean, well, yeah, well, okay, good. So you should know that I'm a, are you a doctor? No. No, I have two doctorates. Okay, so, uh, so this this presentation was made once for a building that they were going to build on a, between LA Fitness and the bank on 123rd. So I check it. It's flawed. Then, because I'm a biased person, as a scientist, you know that uh, I, I am biased. I have my professor, Professor Hill, who still teaches at, at Miami Dade and FIU, who's a doctor in statistics, running. Run, run a similar study, both of them with similar results. The, the, the people who were building and the results were in constant with uh, the results we had. They, they, were not, they were not even close. So I live in that area. I know how dangerous uh, that, uh, those, those two avenues are because I had to go through them to exit my neighborhood because it's the only two lights, it, it, those studies are wrong. And I'm telling you, and I want that on the record, that as a scientist, and uh, begging the pardon of Miss Love, I, I, and somebody who's, uh, you know, who, who the, the studying the methodology of a study is irrelevant. And, and that's that. Thank you, sir. Is there, anyone, is there anyone else now who wishes to speak to the item at hand? Second call, anyone wishing to speak to this? The chair hears no thundering herd, sees no rising cloud of dust, and therefore this part of the public hearing is closed. It's time now for discussion and staff clarifications. Ms. Love, there were some questions answered that are asked rather, perhaps you can clarify some points. Which specific ones did you want me to address her tonight? Uh, they came up earlier, one of the first or second speaker. For the dwelling unit particularly? I'm sorry, sir? I believe someone had a question about the dwelling unit. But the unit sizes. Unit sizes. Okay. Um, our code requires a unit size minimum of 750 square feet, except within the NRO where you can do 25, 20% of, up to 20% of the units can be um, smaller. Uh, as noted um, earlier, uh, or the question earlier about the ALFs, those are not considered dwelling units. Those are cons because they are, do not constitute what defines a dwelling unit by our code. So they are, uh, that's the reason that they need that much square footage because they convert the square footage into those um, bed service areas in addition to office and retail and the other things that they're proposing. Did that clarify that question, you think? Is, is, yeah, I think somebody raised the underlying zoning for that property is PU. Right. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't allow for ALFs. And the NRO doesn't, doesn't add ALFs to the underlying zoning. So how do they put an ALF on the site? Well, when you look at the inner row, um, and I'm going to let uh, Kent, because this is, he's practicing his presentation skills, so I'm going to, and he, he did the actual technical review along with Nixon, LeBron. Um, I'm going to ask him to speak directly to that. Um, and if you'd like to answer that question. Yes, I can, yeah, I can answer that. The NRO does not, it allows for mixed use. It does not prohibit ALFs specifically 
as well as any other type of uses. It just requires mixed use with the component of having residential as part of that rig. Actually, that's well. not correct. It talks about permitted uses within the NRO to be added to the underlying zoning, and ALFs aren't mentioned. Correct. There's there's some uses that are mentioned, but like for example, like if you were to have, let me grab that part. You, you've got permitted uses for each zone, and PU doesn't allow for ALF. And then the then the table, the chart, that shows the NRO will allow added uses to the underlying zoning. It's got district wide, and then just within the PCDs, and ALFs aren't allowed. The ALFs, so and they're not allowed in the underlying zoning, and they're not added. So the question, I guess, is. How do they get into the project? Because it's allowing for a combination of uses. So within the NRO, the uses are as approved. It has for the entire district residential mixed use and accessory uses. And then you've got to go into the definition of mixed use. So the mixed use definition, and I'll read that for you within Article 7, is defined as three or more uses that include one of which is residential. So just like if you were to have multiple uses for mixed use, retail as well, for example, going back to the applicable uses, for a mixed use for the entire district of the NRO, since it is non-residential and ALF, the accessory uses, see how you see retail sales and service? is not listed for the entire district, but under mixed use it is allowed. So that for ALF and other uses, such as a Mocha Artist Gallery, is allowed under mixed use. So the mixed use umbrella allows well, for the ALF. That's close, isn't it? I mean, at residentials, then residential, just this, and ALFs don't count as dwelling units. We just went through that right. speech. But it's so these are residences without dwelling units. <laughs> Yes, they're living spaces. Seems rather a bit of a conflict, yeah. doesn't it? But we define our dwelling units very specifically. You know, you have to have a kitchen and, you, have, you know, cooking facilities. And, and you'll notice that these do not have any type of facilities that make it actual a dwelling unit. Um, so it's not... It's hard to it, call it residential. They... It's really not residential. Well, you've got to tell him that because it's he just explained that no, it's no, allowed no. because it's residential. No, it's Within no the mixed use, mixed use is required to have mixed use, right? One of those mixed uses in this project the has to be residential. And so when we look at what is, uh, what is proposed for those workforce and senior housing, and by the way, the entire project is over 55 Fifteen percent have to be workforce, and the remainder is a mix of incomes. Um, that's why ALFs are not excluded in any fashion. Um, there are only certain uses that are not allowed in that by right. So we're sure this is okay. Yes, it meets every it, because you're not saying here. Look, ALFs, ALFs are, are excluded. List, ALFs are listed as a use. ALS, uh, yes. So, but they are also listed as a option for mixed use because it is a use. And our, our, our code does not specifically say you cannot have right. ALFs as part of this mixed use project. And to because further- Because they're residential, in, not because they're a use. It's because ALF is a use. It's ALF a is a use. use, it's a specific use. Assisted living facility is a special specific use called out in our code. It's an accessory use to the primary use, which is mixed use within this development, which has residential, as well as in our comprehensive plan, it actually it actually recommends that you have ALS within the NRO within in the conjunction NRO. with mixed use. I guess use. that'll be determined later, because I think there's some probably dual points of view on that. Well, you have to remember, too, the NRO specifically calls out ALFs in the NRO. They want ALFs in the NRO. So that's one of the reasons why we, uh, you don't see them specifically excluded because they're actually 
called for within the NRO, along with senior housing, too, and a mix of housing <coughs> options, which this project, then the residential component is the apartment building itself. And then you have the retail activity and you have the ALF, so now you have your three uses, one of which is residential, the apartments. That's how this project is proposed and meets all the criteria within the NRO, particularly the ALF, when the NRO actually calls for more ALFs within the NRO. I couldn't find it any so that's why I asked the question. Yes, sir. So, all right, well, do you have any other questions, Bob? Yeah, I actually yeah, do. Please do. So, this is a good time to get into these. This is, so within the, within the project, I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record because I've been talking about parking again. And so there's 175 apartments. Oh, here's the other number. There's 175 apartments totaling 300, 280 bedrooms. It's 280 bedrooms in this apartment, this apartment building. 175 units. And so, so I have two, two issues. One, throughout the entire staff report, I keep seeing affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's required in this is 26 units for affordable housing. Because 20, that's... 15% of the 175, and then, oh, by the way, we may have a couple over here in the 175. Mm -hmm. So there's 26 affordable housing units required in this project, but we talk about it 25 times. That's because the applicant know, is proposing makes, the, the mix of incomes. Well. Yes, sir. Then there's, so the, you've got all these apartments. If, you, if it was non-elderly, by the way, that would require 263 parking spaces right. plus guest parking. But we've called this senior ho housing. We've called it elderly housing, which in our code has no definition. That's great. We don't define elderly housing. We don't define senior housing. Mm -hmm. But... Because of that, we take the requirement for parking from 1.5 units to 0.5 units. So Dade County won't go that low. Dade County says it's in elderly housing, which they actually define, it's one parking space per unit. So we're 50% of what the county wants, mm -hmm. which is why we have parking. We have adequate parking because we've defined ourselves out of it. So we have 149 spaces, I think. There's, again, 280 bedrooms and 70 ALF spots. And ALF requires one spot per bedroom. No deviations from that. One spot per bedroom. So that's another 70. So that brings our total for the day to 377 units if this weren't elderly housing. Yes, so the county and we agree on what the numbers should be, by the way. The county's at 390, we're at 377. So the county has an elderly provision. And the county's elderly provision for this project would require 276 parking spaces. Because that's one per unit, and that's 175 spaces for 200 and, what did I tell you, for 350 bedrooms, which is a little light anyway. And that's why everybody's up here talking about lack of parking. Because we have a requirement that we would place on a regular building of 377 units, and we're allowing this building to go with 149, which seems light. And I understand the shared parking model you're about to bring up, Mr. DeLaGuardia. The problem with the shared parking model is we take each of these classes of people and we decide when they're going to use the building. So if it's residential, they use the building really at night and they're out during the day, they're working nine to five, right? And the restaurants don't need them at night, so we have this formula for sharing parking. But the only problem with this is we reduce the parking because we call these people elderly and then in the sharing model, we count them as being out in the workforce all day which seem like we're trying to cut it both ways. And I'm not comfortable with that a little bit. By anybody's measure, by the county elderly parking requirements, 
there's 276 required spaces, and we're a little better than 50% of that. Mm -hmm. So I think this is another problem with putting five pounds of water in a two-pound bucket or a two-gallon bucket. So that's why there's not a, there's clearly not, and there's a hundred full-time employees, by the way, just no, not for nothing. So there's, there, there there, we, we need, you need a parking structure three times this large, and we don't have it, and so, again, all the overflow parking flows into the streets of the city. If I may, Mr. Pichon, I understand your concern that perhaps the city should have other parking requirements. But right now, your argument is the equivalent of saying, if my aunt were a man, she'd be my uncle. We are not talking about the county. We're not talking about what is like terrifically great ideas. We're talking about the code as it exists now. I'm sorry if you don't like what the code says now. We have no now. definition for elderly housing. We don't have to. Well, and we my don't. house is an elderly house, and so is everybody up here. And, and fortunately, <laughs> I'm on. Well, and, and well that's true. Would you, how many of you would like anyway. to not take? I, I don't know. Anybody want to fight with him about that? Again, again. What we're doing is we're abiding by the rules of the city. If you want to change the rules, then change the rules. I don't like it that people are allowed to put $20 billion overseas and not pay their taxes but that's what the codes of this country allow. So we can change that, and we can change our parking, but please, your argument you're making out of whole cloth, we have met the parking requirements. I'm what sorry is, if you don't like it. What entitles you to call this elderly housing? The fact that it is 55 or older, and there's a covenant that's gonna make us do that for like ever and a day. By whose standard? There's no definition for elderly housing, so how do you meet the standard? <sighs> I'm gonna say it one more time. The United States of America recognizes that people who are 55 or older are allowed to discriminate against people who are younger. So you, you have heard of senior residents, right? You've heard of, of the fact that you can have an apartment building, a condominium, or an entire community where you can have people 55 and older and no one else. So it doesn't matter that it's not defined in our code, it's defined in the law. And 55 and older is a senior housing project and our code, our comprehensive plan, actually encourages that specific use. Well, I, I, I hear your argument, sir. And the fact that Fair Housing Act allows discrimination by people 55 and older, that they are allowed to say no, no children under the age of 18 allowed in the building. It doesn't change their parking. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very convenient, I understand it's a convenient argument. You have changed the parking. You have. This is the city of North Miami. This city has changed the parking requirement. Frankly, I agree with you. But that's what the law allows. Okay. Right, Mr. Pichon. Let me just uh, illuminate a little something. Uh, <clears throat> it's 55 and older, it's senior housing. The financing of that also requires them to be senior and to qualify with a certain income to live there. Your zoning ordinance provides elderly parking for such buildings at 0.5 per unit. It also provides a shared parking uh, clause, a ratio, it allows you to reduce, if you add up all the parking required for the, some of the, the retail, the MOCA space, the ALF, the ALF employees, and the, re and the elderly housing, it, your calculations came to 127.5 spaces, 128 spaces. We hired Joaquin Vargas from Traftec, who's a very prominent traffic engineer and parking analyst, who did this very detailed graph, which I think you have there, and it indicates basing mixed use on the hours of usage, the days of usage, and so forth, and he came up with a, a requirement of 151, mm -hmm. 150, uh, 151, plus we're putting 12 in the perimeter in the right-of-ways, which are not there today, 
So you you know. take the, but you've taken the people, the 175 units, right. where the people there don't need cars because they're elderly. Many don't, and they also and have... And we count them as a workforce for your, for your schedule. Very small amount was, was the workforce. But, but there, you also have alternative transportation. And of that 175 units, only 10%, not 20, 10%, actually 18 units, so it's a little more, 11%, are going to be studios, studios. With, okay. The, the 52 are going to be one bedrooms. 18 and studios and 105 two bedrooms. Correct. That adds up to 280 bedrooms. Right. Based on your code at 0.5 per unit, and with the shared parking ratio, which is in your code, it, you can do this with 128 spaces. We're providing 151 plus the 12 on the perimeters. So that's how it came about, based on the code. And. If you have any quit, the, our parking and traffic analyst is here, Joaquin Vargas. Bob, do you have other questions? No. Okay. Jason? Yes. To address some of the, the issues that some of the residents were bringing up, wh what was this drastic plan change that residents are speaking of? Anyone? Applicant? The plan in regard to the uh, MOCA artist issue, yeah, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, it seems as though I guess at some point uh, you were trying to do or yes, you were and trying we to do community met with, outreach. We met with MOCA. We met with MOCA on many occasions. We met with the administration on many occasions. They would not commit to being part of this project because of financial reasons. We have nonetheless put away to the side 1,800 square feet if MOCA wants to come aboard. We have never, ever prevented MOCA from stepping up to the plate. They haven't done it. Maybe it's because they went through a change of directors. You know, we had some issues with that. But we've never, ever done anything deliberately to prevent artists or MOCA from coming in as part of this project. Um, the issue was the stories, the two stories along 123rd Street. Um, yeah, yeah, the public area is closed. It's John is the attorney for the developer. He's allowed, but the public area part is closed. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, moving on to the traffic. Uh, I did notice that it looks like what the report was done and resulted in a level of service of C. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members, Joaquin Vargas with Traftech Engineering. Yes, sir. Um, wh what, what is the existing level of service for you? I don't, do you have a copy of the traffic yes, report? Yes, if you it's go to page, right. table two, which is on page 19, we do have the last three columns. One is the existing conditions. The second to last column is the projected traffic to the year 2020 without this project. And then the last column is the projected level of service year 2020 with the project. So it's existing, future without, and future with the project. So those are the levels of services documented for those three scenarios for the, for the morning rush hour as well as the afternoon rush hour. Can you please state what the, what the existing condition is? The, let me... See, none of the level of service, with one exception, change. One uh, twenty-fifth and ninth is is D as in dog. One twenty-fifth and ten is B. Um, and all of the access driveways are projected to be a level of service B and A. The only level of service that changes as a result of this project is one twenty-fifth Street and Tenth Avenue. In the afternoon rush hour, mm -hmm. it's projected to be a B as in boy, and it drops a letter C as in cat. D as in dog is the standard, so it's still one le one level better than the standard. Okay, and, and my experience, I guess, on the development side is C is actually kind of rare when you're even in a very dense urban environment like we're in. So to not even hit D, you know, 
that's fairly good. So it shouldn't experience like this huge influx of traffic. You, you, you are correct when you're talking about uh, major intersections. Uh, mm -hmm. None of these intersections are major intersections, like 123rd and Biscayne Boulevard. It's a major intersection. It's very rare to find those intersections operating adequately. But these intersections, I don't consider them major because of the nature of the side streets, they're yeah. two, two lane roadways. That's true. So you have a lot of green time <coughs> that's allocated to the main street. One of the things about these level of service is it's, it's an average wait time, and, and people that arrive in green, mm -hmm. they have a zero wait time. So all those cars that get in, in green, you, you, when you average all those zero delay with the others, that's what brings everything to, a, to an acceptable level of service. Mm. Okay. Um, thank you. And I have a couple other questions about what the residents brought up. So. Uh, no more traffic. Right. Thank you very much. Someone mentioned about the ALF being able to change, but I think someone else brought it up that through the covenant, it can't that that use cannot change, right? Does that run with the land, or does it run with the property owner? I'm sorry. With the sorry. go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, does it run with the land or with the applicant? The terms provide that it runs with the land, right? Okay. And it's uh, automatically renews for ten ten year periods. It's in the packet, mm -hmm. so you can read the terms. But it's intended to run with the land. With the land. So if someone if they, if they decide to if someone decides to build, construct, sell it off, it doesn't matter. That con <coughs> that restriction is still in place. Right. That's the purpose of recording the cover. Got it you. survives foreclosures. It survives tax deed sales. I mean, it, it's intended to stick with the property. Okay. Um, and then there was also a lot of concerns about whether or not this was appropriate for, for the area or if this, this size of development is, is appropriate. You know, and really the way I see this is kind of an extension of our downtown area. And if we can't support, you know, multi-story developments in our downtown area, I really don't know where else would be the best place to support it. So I just want to make a general statement about that. If, um, if I may, it's paragraph six of the covenant that provides for it. Oh, for the one? Okay, right. thank you. Sure. Uh, let's see, parking. Parking's already been discussed. Flooding. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know I, I think flooding, and I, I know this was brought up, like, uh, especially during construction activities. Um, you know, my understanding is that this project will have to go to DRC and has to eventually get a building permit and all those construction documents require some form of an erosion control plan that needs to be put in place during construction. So, you know, for the residents to have concerns, I'm, you know, I would hope that um, that is calmed down a little bit because really we have those provisions already built in until the review and entitlement process with the city. And the last thing, uh, with the art, in public places, what are what are the um, what are this what are like the requirements for that? Like, does who gets the final say of what is art and what is not? You know, something that they're just trying to meet code or that provision. I'm, I'm kind of unfamiliar with that. One percent of the total cost of the art building. Art in public places is governed under uh, five dash twenty one zero one of the code. Um, and what it requires is that we take a look at the, uh, we have a committee that actually reviews uh, the public mm. art that is proposed for um, any of the uses that go here in the city. Okay. So, and that includes it, murals, public art, and, and, and different. And we have a art selection committee that uh, this goes before them and they actually make the final determination as to whether indeed it meets the criteria of art. art. And that happens during DRC? That happens as part of, DRC. part of DRC, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess uh, my final question does have to do again with construction activities. You know, there seem to be a lot of concerns with um, how uh, developers are, I guess, leaving um, sites after construction is done, swale restorations, I mean, who, who, who do we rely upon to make sure, or who the residents will rely upon to make sure that 
those type of things get addressed post construction? Would that be like code enforcement, or is that? It would be building, is that? Yeah, the building department and code enforcement. Okay, so then if if this were to occur, the residents will be able to contact code enforcement, and then the the um, the entity that was in charge of doing the damage would have to come back, restore it before they um, so that the, the resident would have to foot that bill, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the only questions I have. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. James. Michael? Uh, no questions. No questions. All right. Commissioner Reach. With regards um, to the construction, what would you be putting in there? French drains to capture the, okay? To re yeah, alleviate yeah, the flooding? Uh, yeah. Flooding, if there's flooding there today, we're going to resolve that problem. You'll never have flooding there again. I can tell you that because by code, you cannot... You have to take care of all the water that hits your site caused by God and caused by machinery that may generate water. And we'll probably be doing that with deep wells. That's the way we do it in Bay Harbor. That's the way we're doing it in North Miami Beach. We literally have to drill maybe two, three, maybe even four deep wells down into the aquifer and dispose of the water. But before you dispose of it, it goes into settlement tanks and it purifies it and cleans it and so, and so forth. It's a process. Mm -hmm. It's expensive, but that, that will happen, and you will not have any water problems on that site or around the site unless it's caused by the streets. Okay. Dur during the construction phase, and say you have 50, 60 <coughs> people out there, okay. Like I would see over in Sunny Isles, they would have a designated area to park a bus would take them over to the construction mm -hmm. site. Is that how we would do it in this neighborhood? We would have a designated area where the construction workers could park their vehicles, mm -hmm. and then we would transport them over to uh, uh, I mean, because I, I could visualize this, you know, all of a sudden, this, you know, 100 cars in the neighborhood parking on the swales and this and that. That's yeah. something I think you, no, you're going to have to. It's got to be resolved. So, Many different ways. One is what you just said, a designated lot that they come to, and there's some sort of transportation system. Maybe the owner has to deal with that, you know, or maybe we have to rent a lot somewhere nearby that's available. I mean, but it's got to be dealt with. They can't the park illegally. Way. It's a police thing, you know. Yeah, but, but I mean, we, we, should, we, should, we should work on that now to alleviate any stress in the community and not, right. not take it for granted, but let's agree that we're going to do something of that nature for we don't we don't and, uh, infringe on the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, and let's it, be good neighbors with that. Right. I mean, that's only fair to them. You wouldn't want that in Absolutely. your neighborhood. I wouldn't Horrible. want it in mine. We don't have it in Bay Harbor. It happened, and we we caused them to rent lots elsewhere and okay. to transport the workers over. You know, the other way is you can logistically plan it so you're not building the entire site at one time. You might be going from north to south or from south to north, mm -hmm. and and the parts that you're not building on, you could be parking on temporarily. What you know. would be the uh, you, you, this is uh, hey, let me uh, just I'll, add I'll this. Review now, but we, let's get back to parking just yeah. for a second. You have a one, two, th was it a four story parking garage? I'm looking at it, it or a three. It's three and a half. Three and a half. Split levels. Right. Is there a possibility of adding another story to it? There's could, could always we do a that and, and alleviate some of the traffic. Physically, oh, I mean the parking. Yeah, physically, there's always that possibility. Why don't we you look know? at that? But uh, I mean you know, our our studies by our engineers and by people that have elderly housing facilities and ALFs say that you don't need much more parking than this. In fact, we're providing more than the code request. I I, I understand that, but that's you know, yeah. there's reality, then there's reality, and, yeah. and and I don't mean to be condescending, but I I think this is a nice project. I like what I saw well, here. And I Thank think you. by adding another floor, right. you're going to get, you know, just yeah. it's the right thing to do, in my estimation. And, and there's another thing that we were taught we could do also in, the, in these neighborhoods. You know, a lot, a lot, a lot of communities that they, they have um, authorized parking where, you know, you, you live in a neighborhood, you have a sticker. We could be doing the same thing in, in, in that neighborhood or, or the neighborhood we just approved on, on 8th Avenue and or 9th Avenue and 130th Street, resident parking only. I, I mean, that's, that's something that we really should be looking at. Let's take a look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I'll see when I walk down 135th Street, you can't park your cab up in Aventura, so they'll park their cabs down on 135th Street, which is wrong. You know, I mean, we, we should be looking at parking <coughs> control like that. 
I'm sorry? Wait till FIU goes forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me. Um, you know, with, with regards to the building, uh, this to me, and I know we're probably going to have a difference of opinion, but I'm looking at the bank building to the north. I'm looking at Villa Maria over to the east. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at an apartment building to the west. And you have streets that are separating you from the, from, from the residential area. And to me, this is just... I, I kind of like this project. I think it's, 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 it's where... It, otherwise, we're not going to redevelop this city. And I, 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 and I think it's quite appropriate in that area. Um, the building, to me, looks modern. It's a, the, the rooftop gardens, the, the, the swimming pools up there. I, I kind of like it. swimming pools, recreation. I, I, I mean, I, and, and you do have the covenant. You have to be 55 or older to live there. Uh, we do have a... Uh, an issue with elderly that they need affordable housing. And to me, I, I, I just thought this was a nice, nice project. But please, let's look at thank you adding another floor to it. Well, there's other ways we could possibly look into some mechanical systems for the parking stuff. Well, mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> okay, I, I was just going to say add another floor. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's my that's my uh, my suggestion. Anyway, thank you. Yes, Mike, you can make a comment if you have no questions. Okay. I don't have any questions, but I do have a, have a comment. And you mentioned it, actually, um, about some of the mechanical things that, that can help deal with the parking. Yeah. Um, I agree with Kenny that, obviously, another floor would be a great thing, okay, for the, the, for the community, for the neighborhood. Um, but on the other hand, and 55, you know, they say 70 is the new 50. We hope. We hope. <laughs> and uh, we, we have people who are beginning whole new lives and careers at 55. Right. But that's, as John pointed out, that's the code. Okay? That's <laughs> Most of them ride bicycles. It, exactly. So, <laughs> it, 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 I mean, I think the building is beautiful, and I think you put a lot of different components together that really make it a real nice addition to our downtown. And I like the fact that it's right next door to Villa Maria. I think that there's a real synchronicity there. Um, so, um, yes, there is. other than other than those other than those comments, um, I, I think it's a welcome addition uh, to our downtown. And um, you know, and what we're here for tonight is really not to discuss parking. We have a very limited thing on the agenda. Uh, you're going to go back to the DRC anyway for Absolutely. comments, so it'll come back to us. So I think in just dealing with the question before us tonight, uh, I, I'm in support of this. This is for sure. You know, getting back to parking, we know we have these rules and regulations, right? And what did William Jennings Bryan, your hero, always say, John? He said, when the law and common sense collide, let us always hope that common sense prevails. This is going to be your first project, and I hope that you're going to build many more in the city. But I think by showing some goodwill and by going the extra step and adding another level to that parking garage is going to help your image, not your particular, but the, the, the building's image. No, I understand. And, 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 and looking at further development. I mean, we, we get into this formula, well, this is the law, this is this, this is that, but it, it's, it doesn't fit. Like Bob said, it doesn't fit. But by adding something more to it, Going out there and spending a few more bucks. Come on, it, it, it's a worthwhile yeah. project. Mr. Chairman, Thank can you. I make one more comment? <coughs> yes, you may. It'll be it'll be quick. Um, I, I'm involved with the Foundation for Senior Citizens, and I can tell you that there is a need for Tremendous. senior housing in North Miami. As a matter of fact, many years ago, we attempted to buy an apartment building right close to here, so that. Um, elderly who are currently in single-family homes that could be made available to new families moving into the community and they could go to a secure facility around other elderly. We right. tried this several years ago because it's a great concept um, and we know there's a need for it. So, Thank you for your comments. We will definitely study further the parking issue. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Chair, I did want to answer one question that the community member had that I wrote down that I didn't get a chance to clarify. The question was, isn't there separation requirements between ALFs? Yes, indeed it is. However, Villa Maria is not licensed as an ALF. 
Um, so we actually researched that. That was part of our due diligence in preparing this package for you. Um, and they are not licensed as an ALF. They're, they're classified as a, as a residential nursing home facility. As a, a nursing home, correct. And, and a rehab, rehab, it's not the same thing. Next to them, but not an ALF. Correct. It's not licensed as an ALF. Yeah. All right. At this point, the uh, chair is prepared to call for a motion. I move approval of the uh, application. All right. Mike Second. McDiarmid moves to recommend approval of the bonus units as requested. Do we have a second to the second. motion? Second. Kenny. Kenny each seconds the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 You're in. And one opposed. All right, so we have four to one. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And and Kenny, we won't be crucified on the cross of gold. <laughs> uh, yes, John. It's always nice to see you. Yes. Well. Yes. Next meeting is uh, April sixth. April. <laughs> April 6th? April 2nd? April 6th. I'm sorry, right. April 3rd. Tuesday, April 3rd. Tuesday, April 3rd. All right, there being no further matters before this commission, this meeting stands adjourned. I don't believe I need a motion. <laughs>